Honorable Agriculture Secretary William Dar, Dr. Bernard Villegas, UPLB Chancellor Jose Camacho Jr., my colleagues at the Manila Times, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. On behalf of the Manila Times, welcome to today's business forum, Prospects for Agriculture Beyond the COVID Pandemic. This is an appropriate theme, given that our collective attention is now turned toward recovery from the impact of this health crisis. At our last event, our keynote speakers shared their forecast of a robust growth in 2021. Their message was reassuring for sure. GDP growth outlook this year is between 6.5% and 7.5%, and inflation is projected to be benign around 4%. Of course, the situation remains fluid. Just recently, we saw an alarming surge of new COVID-19 cases that has triggered new recommendations, if not fears, of another hard lockdown. That, of course, will deal a blow to the rosy economic prospects for this year and beyond. I believe that we are not alone in hoping that the recently mandated bubble over Metro Manila and some of its adjacent provinces will be enough to arrest this new wave of cases. That would allow the country to continue moving forward to recovery. If the country is to realize its economic targets, key industries and sectors will need to perform. Perhaps, most important, perhaps the most important sector is agriculture, which is naturally why we are all gathered here today. We hope to hear from our speakers the outlook for this vital sector, and perhaps its expected contribution to the total economy. We expect that the discussion today will also cover the threats of the forecasted growth, including issues with food supply that may be responsible for the cost push inflation seen of late, as well as related supply chain concerns that have a similar effect. Perhaps we should even hear some policy recommendations that will address development aspirations, including food security. As you see, we have a substantive topic to cover today. And like you all, I am eager to hear from our speakers. Before I yield the screen, please allow me to express our appreciation to those who helped make this program possible. Thank you to our sponsors, Planters Products Incorporated and San Miguel Corporation. Thank you also to our special partners, Agricultural Credit Policy Council and I Advertise Solutions. And to our organizational partners, the British Chamber of Commerce, the French Chamber of Commerce and Industry in the Philippines, the Financial Executive Institutes of the Philippines, the Management Association of the Philippines. And our appreciation also goes to our media partner, the Manila Times TV. Last but not least, thank you to all those watching this event today on the Manila Times website, the Manila Times channels on YouTube and Daily Motion, and the Manila Times channel on live mobile app, one of our newest offerings. Your friends and colleagues who cannot be here today can still read about the discussions from our print edition and from its exact, from its exact replica, the Manila Times digital edition, which is available globally and is the fastest and most convenient way to get our national daily newspaper access to your mobile phone, desktop, laptop, or another gadget. Once again, thank you. And I now turn you over to our moderators, Mr. Conrad Carino and Ben Critz. Thank you, everybody, for joining us under these difficult circumstances. I would like to introduce our keynote speaker today, and we're very fortunate to have him with us, as well as have him as our Secretary of the Department of Agriculture. There is probably no greater agricultural expert in the Philippines and possibly not the whole world. Uh, Dr. William Dar comes to the position after having served as, for 15 years as the Director of ICRASAT, which is the International Crops Research Institute for the Semi-Arid Tropics. Uh, which is now known, thanks to his leadership, as one of the leading agricultural institutions in uh, in the world. As I said, he is a he is a graduate of Bengal State University, uh, where he also obtained a master of science in agronomy, and he has his doctorate in horticulture from the University of Philippine at Los Banos. Uh, would you please welcome Agriculture Secretary Dr. William D. Dar? Yeah. Many thanks, uh, Mr. Ben Kreitz, for the kind introduction. Let me also greet the uh, very respectable uh, leader of the Manila Times, Mr. Dante Francis Ang, our most respected uh, guru 
of Agribusiness in the Country, Dr. Bernardo Villegas, uh, UPLB Chancellor Dong Camacho, the uh, other uh, uh, or the organizers of this very important uh, meeting or conference today with this uh, topic which I have just, uh, in, you know, adjusted a bit, Philippine agriculture today and beyond the COVID-19 pandemic. The world has changed tremendously as a result of the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. Food security concerns has not been spared by the pandemic. The fight against COVID-19 pandemic continues. It is now leading us into a new world, a new environment, a new normal. So I would like to uh, start from a global perspective. What have been the impacts of COVID-19 in agriculture? I think everyone is aware that uh, there have been disruptions in food supply, not only last year, but that continues up until today with all the lockdowns of countries, uh, the, uh, there are cross-border and domestic restrictions of movement of food. Now, uh, with the GCQ even now coming back for NCR bub plus NCR plus, that's the bubble today. Uh, we are monitoring uh, the movements of food uh, supply, particularly those coming from the provinces. Labor shortages uh, are uh, occurring because of the lockdowns. There are many uh, requirements. Border closures are there. Hundreds of thousands of seasonal workers cannot reach their uh, respective areas. And so uh, uh, open on with the uh, fight against COVID-19, the shortages for labor uh, really uh, is a major uh, impact. And uh, when you have labor shortages, of course, there is reduction in job quality in the sector, job destruction, especially at the base of the supply chain. And uh, much more, we are seeing the poorer sector of the economy or any country for that matter being affected by all these lockdowns. And so uh, they don't have enough uh, capital even to uh, buy their own food uh, for three square meals a day. Now further, food wastage is happening due to restrictions on movement, uh, which prevented farmers from accessing markets. Of course, I would like to uh, qualify that there have been improvements over time, but with the second surge of the COVID-19, uh, you will uh, see how, uh, again, uh, this would uh, continue to be so, would waste it. Then, of course, uh, the livelihoods of millions of uh, plantation workers engaged in export-oriented and labor-intensive agricultural production in most of the developing countries, countries have been affected and will continue to be so. And uh, even, for example, with the uh, present uh, GCQ happening, the, with the increasing number of COVID-19 cases, offices in agriculture are also, uh, you know, experiencing the same uh, impact uh, in terms of uh, increasing COVID-19 uh, cases. And so you need to reduce and would uh, also affect the productivity of various uh, offices uh, in uh, not only government, but private sector for that matter. So uh, in a number of cases, there are spikes happening, not only locally, but even globally as a result of, again, many of these countries stockpiling 
and uh, of course uh, the international trade is uh, distorted and so uh, panic buying uh, as a result of all of this and uh, in the country today uh, the prices spikes because of also another important uh, issue like the african swine fever pork has uh, been pork prices have been badly affected and because uh, of the thinning uh, inventory that we have in the pork industry now in regard to the number of people in extreme poverty because of covid-19 there is a uh, increasing number or additional uh, 800 no 88 million people have been pushed into extreme poverty and of course uh, in a worst case scenario this will increase even to 115 additionally and again uh, poverty is related to uh, hunger if you don't have money to buy your food then the hunger uh, stocks the this one uh, is showing the trends in global economic growth. Uh, the world output in general has been really declining, uh, minus uh, point, minus four point three percent, and uh, from the uh, developed countries, uh, you will see a declining trend as well in economic growth, including that, of course, from the developing countries. Now, we have looked at the prices of pork and chicken globally, comparing uh, 2020 to now the existing prices uh, in February. So again, the, the two decades data shows an increasing trend in global prices of pork and chicken. Although, of course, uh, last year in the Philippines, chicken have been, uh, in a way, uh, the poultry industry was significantly affected because of the lockdowns again, restaurants were closed, and so <laughs> the poultry industry Really, really have been affected in the same manner as pork because of the African swine fever. Now, according to FAO, poultry meat price increased the most among the international price quotations for all meat types this January, underpinned by brisk global import demand, while avian influenza outbreaks constrained poultry export from several European countries. And of course, when you have outbreaks like avian influenza, we always have to uh, uh, employ or uh, put in place the needed uh, quarantine protocols or even banning importation uh, from countries where avian flu uh, or avian influenza is existing in the same manner as that of the African swine fever. On one hand, pig meat price quotations increased in January but slightly fell in February due to reduced purchases from China. Again, China have been badly hit as well uh, by the African swine fever. And so uh, uh, there are uh, also other uh, countries uh, heavily impacted too by uh, ASF and so uh, there is uh, increasing unsold pigs in Germany due to the continued ban of exports to Asian markets. Now what about maize and soybeans? The global prices of maize and soybeans also has an increasing trend from the year 2000 to February 2021. And uh, international uh, corn prices increased significantly, which reflected an increasingly tight global supply 
with lower than earlier expected production and stock estimates in the United States of America and substantial purchases by China. So when China moves, when I say moves, uh, buying a lot, this, uh, the world, of course, will always be affected significantly. Now, concerns over dryness in South America and a temporary suspension of maize export registrations in Argentina added support, pushing international maize prices up to their highest level since mid-2013. And similarly, soybean has a firmer demand and price increase. So when you talk of prices of maize and soybean, these are the very ingredients for feeds, for livestock and poultry. So they are really impacting as well to uh, further uh, development of the livestock industry. Now, what about the uh, rice across selected countries, particularly uh, in Asia, Thailand, Vietnam, uh, India, and Pakistan? So across these selected countries, the global price of rice, 25% broken, as an increasing trend from January 2000 to February 2021. So this trend in rice prices of Vietnam and Thailand are relatively steeper compared to India and Pakistan. In Asia, the strength dominating Thai and Vietnamese Indica markets extended into first half of February as supplies remain tight ahead of the arrival of Thai oak season harvest and the Vietnamese winter spring crop into the market. Now, let me mention that uh, in the case of rice, the Department of uh, Finance, supported by the Department of Agriculture, have uh, forwarded uh, it's a proposal to the Tariff Commission and or the uh, com Committee on uh, Tariff and uh, Related Matters for us to uh, give a most preferential nation status to India uh, so that uh, the, the whole intent is when there is tightening of supplies like uh, most countries in Southeast Asia, then we, we have a broader uh, source and uh, that's the only main reason why we have uh, endorsed the DOF uh, uh, proposal for uh, giving India the most preferential uh, nation status uh, so that uh, we can uh, source our additional requirements from uh, that place of the world. Now uh, if we look at uh, and compare ourselves, actual and forecast GDP growth in ASEAN countries, you will see really that Philippines had uh, really been badly impacted too. Uh, of course, Thailand has a higher level of contraction of their gross domestic product. We follow them. Then the, oh, Singapore as well, Malaysia, and Cambodia. So uh, everyone is affected. Of course, there are countries uh, showing here, like Myanmar and Vietnam, uh, that have not been badly affected, including that of Brunei, Darussalam. Now, next slide. Uh, Going uh, and putting our lens in the Philippines, it, these are now the uh, impacts or effects of COVID-19 pandemic on Philippine agriculture, which is more or less similar with what I presented uh, global impacts of COVID-19 pandemic. But uh, this is... Uh, coming from the study made by World Bank uh, here in the Philippines from pre-production, supply of inputs, on-farm production, produce transport, 
processing, marketing, and trade. So it, it has been a very uh, significant uh, impact uh, to Philippine agriculture. But later on, I would like to mention what have been the resulting effect of this in terms of our gross domestic product as well in agriculture. Here, here we are. Uh, with all the efforts that we have been doing all these years, catalyzing agriculture and rural development, now uh, some people would say uh, this is, uh, a, 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 you know, of course, we don't want anything negative, but with, if you compare the three sectors with industry, with services, industry getting minus 13.1, services contracted 9.1%, while agriculture only contracted at minus, or yeah, contracted at 0.2%. I would call this still a significant uh, growth because we did not uh, really uh, uh, have a higher level of contraction. Uh, point two would be a flat growth. And uh, of course, in general, the, the Philippine economy is really uh, in bad shape and agriculture uh, would be considered as with this growth in spite of COVID-19 pandemic, in spite of the African swine fever, then uh, we believe that uh, with more uh, uh, investments, with more budgetary support, and timely and proper implementation of programs and projects, we believe this is one area that we can uh, go positive uh, this year, this time around. And uh, this early, I would like to believe that uh, we are still hopeful, in, in even with the COVID-19 pandemic and the African swine fever, that we can go positive to uh, about 2.5% growth level. Now, what have been uh, put in place since last year and continue to be an important, uh, you know, program umbrella? We call it Plan, Plan, Plan program. And Plan, Plan, Plan program is an encompassing program, not only for crops, but for livestock, poultry, and fisheries. Of course, uh, if you compare the budget today, this year, between that of last year, there have been uh, an increasing level of budget. But uh, if you look at the parity principle, uh, if we say 9 to 10% contribution of agriculture to the economy, uh, we are only getting between 2 to 2.5% uh, of the annual national budget. So uh, with uh, we, we really have to uh, uh, increase our energy uh, and plant, plant, plant program has become the platform to really encourage everyone, all the stakeholders for this very goal uh, during this pandemic to increase food sufficiency levels due to the very reasons I have mentioned earlier about uh, the distortions of trade, the lockdowns and uh, many other constraints along the way. So we continue to uh, have these interventions uh, and we believe that uh, major uh, activity have been in terms of uh, linking the producers to the market, to the consuming public is one major important intervention that we have put in place last year and we will continue to do so. Even urban agriculture, uh, which was even uh, implemented before the coming of COVID-19, that has now shown its potential to really uh, bridge or narrow the gap in terms of uh, the availability uh, of food 
uh, in the urban areas during uh, problems of, uh, say, movement of food or lockdowns for that matter. So in, in general, uh, as I've said, while the energy uh, level was there last year, we will continue to do much, much more with uh, timely and proper implementation of the existing banner programs and the new projects that have been approved under this uh, plan, plan, plan program. Now, to mention that with all the efforts last year and RICE still getting bulk of the budget of uh, the Department of Agriculture, we now have a new record uh, rice production ever in 2020 at the level of 19.44 million metric tons. This is equivalent to 90% uh, rice efficiency level. And so uh, this is higher uh, uh, than the 2019 production by 3.3%. So what are the uh, sources of palai production growth in, in last year? If you have to divide this into two uh, major sources, uh, almost 60% came from the use of uh, better technologies, better seeds, the use of more fertilizers, and the capacity extension to really transport technologies. And of course, 41% have been due to favorable cropping conditions, increasing areas like the lowland redfed areas. Now, with all what has been happening all this time since last year, we now have to really uh, look at these policy shifts as now uh, a, a new thing uh, under the COVID-19 environment. So food systems, uh, from that very topic alone, from that very uh, food systems approach, this is now the way to, to handle uh, agriculture and food. It's not just production, but go through the value chain uh, system uh, for us to sustainably feed a growing population in the new normal. And let me also mention that uh, we have also uh, reformulated the food security development framework with which now these are the uh, outcomes of the shift that we are starting to uh, institutionalize in a big way. I have said now and again that that level of uh, food sufficiency, increasing that food sufficiency level of basic food and other commodities that we have competitive advantage will continue to be a major goal. And uh, we need always to go through the uh, harmony between the, the food systems and the other related sectors, uh, energy, economy, water, environment, manufacturing, and health uh, towards uh, building uh, resilience. We need to look at adapting context-specific policies, recognizing the differences between urban and rural settings, but of course, appreciating the interdependence of urban and rural uh, environments. We need now to, as I've said, look at uh, not just focusing on production, but uh, from production to consumption value chain. And uh, in the process, there are the marginalized sector that we need to continue to empower, in, uh, enhance their capacities, and uh, supporting diverse distribution efforts with good logistics. So this is what we have found last year. We don't have much of the good logistics in place. And if there are funding opportunities this time around, the food markets like Food Terminal Incorporated, FTI, uh, being resuscitated, reshaped, now put to shape now and are in harness. We want to establish more regional uh, food terminal markets. 
and uh, have the best of logistics to move uh, food products. We need to address hunger and all forms of malnutrition, such as obesity and micronutrient deficiencies from production to our, uh, the, through that value chain. And uh, foremost that we are learning is the, the need for us to elevate biosecurity measures. Uh, for example, uh, in regard to ASF, we, are, uh, we now have an ongoing construction of a center for transboundary diseases based in CLSU, but uh, we need a higher level facility uh, that can uh, bring us to the level of, uh, say, uh, whether we can uh, do vaccine development in the country or not. And we are exploring with UPLB to set up that uh, higher level of biosecurity uh, facility uh, with research and a biosecurity facility. And so, yes, we will be tapping the expertise of universities like UPLB for uh, transboundary diseases for that matter. So we are more than prepared than ever than before. Uh, the uh, setting up of that Center for Transboundary Diseases Research Institute is uh, for the longer term, not, of course, for now and for the future. Next, uh, we need now to bring in technology as uh, the engine of growth for improving food productivity levels as well. Now, this would be one of the last slides I would like to highlight. Uh, all these uh, strategies that I have been mentioning are all uh, put in place in a one diagram. We call this uh, Transforming Philippine Agriculture 1DA Agenda. Of course, it's not only the DA that will have to make it work. Uh, it will include multi-stakeholdership, much more the private sector coming forward to invest so much in the uh, agriculture. Now, the strategic communication will always be necessary for, for us to make this possible. But we group them into four pillars, you know, from individual key strategies that you have on the left side, there are uh, uh, agrupations of these into four pillars. And the first uh, group is called the uh, consolidation of uh, farming. So Bayanihan Agri-Clusters is a farm clustering uh, approach that we will do. We, we have set in place uh, the guidelines with which uh, common service facilities will be uh, a major uh, approach so that extension and uh, technology transfer can be much more effective and efficient. We are also enhancing province-led agriculture and fisheries extension systems. We have 16 uh, provinces now uh, being piloted to do really decentralized uh, collaborative agriculture and fishery extension system. Agri the Department of Agriculture will own only be a catalyst and a facilitating institution helping the province to make it possible. Now, it's already necessary for cooperatives development to be, uh, you know, pursued. Collective action is necessary and we need to really engage with our partners so that like the local chief executives are really the ones that are the food security stars at their own right, at their own level. And uh, diversification of agriculture is necessary, not just uh, the rice-centric agriculture that we have mostly today. So there is a transformation towards uh, crop uh, diversification or agricultural diversification. Then one thing we need not forget is the availability of credit because in many 
or in most of the farmers today and fishers, they are indebted always to the uh, traders or the wholesalers dictating the uh, prices during harvest. And so we need to really disentangle this, uh, uh, you know, part, I mean, relationship towards, uh, you know, the farmers having to be part of a collective so that they have more leverage to uh, be given or the, all the empowerment uh, support for that matter. And the second pillar of this one day agenda is modernization. It has been before and will continue to be so. Technology and innovation, including digital agriculture, precision agriculture, name it. Uh, we need to now harness the power of science and technology outputs so that we can bring up to the uh, higher productivity levels that we need to have. Industrialization, you know, uh, we need to learn lessons from our ASEAN member economies. In the agri-industrialization has been a key major pillar of any ASEAN uh, member economy like Thailand, uh, Vietnam, and uh, others. We will need to have uh, to improve our export development uh, prospects and uh, improving the post-harvest processing, logistics, and marketing support. Down the line, the port pillar is called professionalization. You know, we have an aging uh, population in the department in the same manner that there is aging population in the farming sector. Farmers are now averaging about 60 years old. We need to bring in the younger generation to, to, to come forward not only to engage in farming, but also to engage in agribusiness. We need to educate and bring the right expertise. And agribusiness management is one uh, expertise that we need to increase, elevate. And uh, I believe that if you need to activate, have more cooperatives, we need professional managers uh, to really help the farming community, the farmers' cooperatives for that matter. And government has to really uh, be, a, you know, uh, guided always by ease of doing business and transparent procurement and no to corruption. Let me emphasize that. That's professionalization. I have committed myself. I have been bust openly, but I am standing because... Uh, I have that will uh, to implement no to corruption. So with all this properly done, timely done, we are hoping to get this 2021 target growth of 2.5% towards that vision of a food secure and resilient Philippines with empowered and prosperous farmers and fisher folk. So uh, marami pong salamat. Let's plan plan, plan. More than ever, this is the time to really elevate, accelerate, upscale our game. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Dar. It's always, uh, always good to see you and always good to hear some good news for a change. Um, and I believe our program was... Uh, for me to introduce our next speaker. Um, uh, and then we're gonna have uh, we're gonna have some questions, uh, questions and answers after that. Uh, and so if I may, um, Dr. Bernardo Viegas, who is a PhD in economics holder from Harvard University and one of the country's foremost economic and political advisors through several administrations going back to the Corey, admin, uh, Corey Aquino administration where he served as one of the members of the group that formed the 1987 Constitution. He'll be joining us now. Uh, he's one of the founders of the Center for Research and Communication 
and uh, served as the Dean of the School of Economics of CRC for and UANP, which uh, University of Asia and Pacific used to be the CRC College of Arts and Sciences. He was there for some 20 years, is a member of the boards of numerous national and multinational corporations. And as I said, has been a stalwart of uh, policy consultation for decades now. Uh, one of our one of our truly leading lights in the area of economics. Uh, I, I could spend probably the most the rest of our allotted time uh, listing his achievements. Um, he's very familiar to all of us, and we are very fortunate to have him join us here this morning. So would you please welcome Dr. Bernardo Viegas. Good morning, Dr. Viegas. I'm very glad to have this opportunity to have this conversation with people who are focused on agribusiness, and we have received such a comprehensive presentation from the Secretary. I will focus on a few of the important ideas that he presented to us. The first has to do with our expectation for the economy in 2021. You know, in contrast, with my usual reputation as a prophet of boom, probably I'm the most pessimistic about 2021 as regards GDP growth. It's not possible for us to attain figures like six, 7% that have been banded around from the very beginning of this year. In fact, from the very beginning of this year, I said, we will not be able to grow beyond 4% for the whole year. And most of that will be really coming in the last quarter. And I think the reason is obvious. We are mismanaging our response to the pandemic. The vaccines are coming too late. And I don't want to go on and on with the deficiencies of our government in addressing the pandemic problem. So I expect a lot more lockdowns, unfortunately, before the year is over. And that will really cripple our number one engine of growth, which is consumption. But I'd like precisely to highlight what the Secretary mentioned. Last year, as we all know, when the whole economy dropped by 9.5%, agriculture dropped only by minus 0 0.2%. And this reminds me of the other hero sector we have in the economy. The remittances from OFWs, as I'm sure for those of us who are following these remittances, because they're so impart important precisely for consumption expenditures, the drop in remittances was only minus 0.8%, approximating the great performance of agriculture. And I will now venture to say that if the economy grows at 4% for the whole of 2021, I think agriculture will grow by 3%. So, Mr. Secretary, you are conservative. I think the growth of agriculture, seeing all the things that you are doing, I think a 3% growth, which we achieved in the past, what, one of the highest, is possible for 2021. Among other reasons, one of the very positive effects of the pandemic is that all of us in all sectors of the economy are convinced that food security is the number one priority for the country. So finally, when I used to refer to agriculture for many decades as the Cinderella of development constantly being neglected, sometimes criminally, now we see everyone is focused and I'm saying this not to flatter the secretary. Fortunately, we have the right person leading it. Now, let me focus, first of all, on the two most important products as far as hectare of agriculture is concerned. Out of the 14.1 million hectares of agricultural land, we know that rice accounts for 4.4 million while coconut accounts for 2.6 million. So first, let me comment 
on some of what the Secretary said about rice. First of all, I would like to defend very strongly the rice tarification program. Many times the Secretary and other people supporting that move are criticized. And I'm so glad that he mentioned that we're now 90% self-sufficient. But I, together with some of our colleagues in the University of Michigan Pacific, have been for literally decades, since the 1980s, been telling our politicians that it was wrong for us to try to strive for self-sufficiency. You know, one of our agribusiness economists was in the World Bank when they helped Malaysia develop a long-term strategy for agriculture. And in the 1980s, the Malaysian leaders already realistically accepted the fact that they will never be self-sufficient rice, considering their neighbors, Vietnam and Thailand, with so much water facilities. And so they just accepted the commonsensical conclusion that we will be self-sufficient in that uh, period, 70% in rice, and the rest we will import from our neighbors who are more competitive. And what will we do with our land? We will plant higher value commodities like palm oil, rubber, and other fruit trees, and the rest is history. Malaysia became the number one power in palm oil production. We should have decided that long ago, and if we had the right investments in infrastructure, we would have gone beyond bananas and pineapples in exporting high-value products all over the world. But that's the past now. That brings me to what can be done in this 3.6 million hectares of coconut. I'm very glad the Secretary included diversification, especially in coconut. But the first thing that has to be done is to coordinate with the leadership in the Department of Agri Agrarian Reform so that we can undo the many mistakes that were made in the implementation of the Comprehensive Agrarian Reform Program. Make no mistake about it, it was necessary to fragment the land because of social justice. In fact, if you read the Constitution, the state is mandated to distribute large tracts of land to small farmers. So there was nothing wrong with that part of grand reform. What went wrong, as I've always said from the very beginning of the implementation, is that the government gave one to two hectares of land to small farmers. And then I used the phrase I use in Tagalog, the government told the small farmers, Jan na kayo, kanin ninyo ang lupa. Eat the soil. Because they did not provide the small farmers with all the infrastructural and other services that they needed to make that small farm productive. And so the first thing I'd like to remind ourselves is that, and I'm sure the secretary is very aware of that, we have to be coordinating very closely with Sec Secretary Villar and company in the Department of Public Works that they have to continue in their build, build program, focusing on the countryside especially farm to market roads. And in addition, all the infrastructures like irrigation, post harvest, and this is the time I'd like to reiterate what the secretary said. It's not just farming that we are focusing on. It's the whole value chain from farming to post harvest, cold storage, Logistics, especially right now, that everything almost is being by E-Trade. We have to make sure that there is productivity in distribution, and not to mention processing and retailing. So I'd like us to always remember when we say agribusiness, we are not just referring to farming. When we talk about improving the productivity of agribusiness, it's the whole value chain. Now, going back to coconut, there is no way we can improve productivity in that sector, accounting for 3.6 million hectares, if we don't, in coordination with the Department of Agrarian Reform, 
facilitate the reconsolidation of farms so that they can reach economies of scale and diversify into cacao, coffee, and other intercrops and produce higher value products from coconut, like coconut water, coconut milk, all the many diversified products that are very much wanted, especially for health reasons by the world. But that cannot be done if the small coconut farms are individually managed. They have to adopt what I'm sure the secretary was very much exposed to in Malaysia, the nucleus estate system, where a large corporation, whether state or private, will work together with thousands of smallholders and help them plant palm oil, rubber, and in our case, coconut. And I'm sure you already are aware that there are a few outstanding examples of this model right now in the Philippines. One is in Misamis Oriental, another one is in Brooks Point, Palawan, already engaging thousands of small coconut farmers and actually precisely coming out with those high value products that I referred to. And this can also make possible the intercropping since we also have a lot of potentials in cacao and coffee. I'm sure the Secretary knows that Kenimer already has 2,000 hectares in Palawan where they are planting cacao. And I'm always impressed with what Vietnam has done over the last 10 years. 10 years ago, they were not a player in the coffee market. Today, because of very appropriate policies of the state in Vietnam, they are now actually surpassing Brazil in the export of coffee to the world. And very good coffee, as we know in the Philippines. Now, I'd like to also refer to urban gardening. You know, when you talk about food security, we have to be very conscious that over the next five to 10 years, our population will be consuming per capita less and less carbohydrates. They will become upper middle income households. And I'm sure from your own experience, as your income goes up, you eat less rice, kamote, and other carbohydrates. And more and more, there'll be a tremendous increase in demand for vegetables, fruits, and of course, livestock. Now, we have to mobilize, you know, sometimes we laugh at the phrase plantitos and plantitas. People who during the lockdowns have turned to growing vegetables, and not to mention former pilots, stewards, stewardesses, employees of ho uh, hotels that are now unemployed, there is now a certain attraction for urban gardening. These are the people we have to focus on for training and reskilling and upskilling. We have, and with some of us in education are doing this already, convincing a number of universities to put up not degree programs, but short seminars, workshops, webinars, to teach all of these people who are now interested in converting a piece of land they have in Cavite, Batangas, Laguna, as you know, a good number of landowners in, this, in these areas were able to retain five hectares or so during the Granny Farm program. And many of them have not yet been commercialized or industrialized. They still are agricultural. If we can just make sure that these plantitos and plantitas are not doing things in a very amat amateurish way, a number of them are already losing their share because they're not using technology. If we're able to train this army of new agribusiness converts, we can increase the productivity of vegetables and fruits much more than trying to help a small farmer, you know, supplement his rice income or corn income by planting pepper and so on and so forth. That, that's good for poverty alleviation. 
but that's not good for food security. We need a very big increase in the supply, and that requires investments. Small farmers do not have risk capital to get the technology needed for growing papaya in a big way, et cetera, et cetera. And so this right now, actually, a magnificent obsession I have as an educator. How do you convince now some of those 2.7 million students who dropped out of school during the pandemic that there is money in urban agriculture? Many of them belong to middle class and high income families. We just have to make them realize that agribusiness is a very good occupation and profitable one and very healthy one to get into. Then I'd like also to talk about the rice sector. We know that the biggest problem in the rice sector is the neglect of infrastructure by the government of irrigation, farm to market roads, post harvest facilities. In fact, this may be anecdotal. I really feel so ashamed every time I go to Tarlac, and I did so about a month ago, and see on the cemented road, the palai being dried by the farmers. I said, this is scandalous. That is part of the Industrial Revolution 1.0. And here we are talking about Industrial Levels 4.0. And our palai farmers have not gone beyond the revolution which replaced labor with machines. What is so difficult in providing these palai farmers with dryers? And we can go on and on on this neglect. In a way, I see a positive trend where most of the budget of the government in Build, Build, Build is not being spent in Metro Manila or Metro Cebu. I see that more and more of them are in the countryside, including, of course, the farm, farm to market roads. And this is something that we should be glad about. If Manila or Cebu want to have better skyways and so on and so forth, uh, subways, let Ramon Ang, let Mani Pangilinan, let all these private sector investors do it to PPP. But the government's budget in infrastructure should be focused on the countryside. And this will address, to a great extent, the problem of farm productivity in the Palai sector. And finally, I'd like also to refer to the need for managers. So when I talked about the plantitos and plantitas, I'm referring to people who will actually produce these high value crops in urban farms. But we also need a lot more people who can manage, for example, these uh, estates of coconut and other products in a very professional way. This is where I go to the item of professionalization. We may have a good number already of scientists coming from Los Banos, but we have a dearth of managers who understand the whole agribusiness change chain. And therefore we need schools, whether it's AIM, Ateneo, etc., to get into programs that will produce agribusiness managers. This was done at Harvard more than 50 years ago. We need to do that now in our university system. They don't even have to be degree programs. They can be short executive education courses that will take people who are already professionals, whether it be engineers, whether it be scientists, whether it be even lawyers, but who have an inclination towards agribusiness. And let's train them in the field of agribusiness management. We will need them in a big way in the coming years as we address more and more the issue of food security. I think I've said enough. I'll be willing to answer questions. Thank you very much again. 
Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Villegas. Uh, you have not lost your, uh, your brilliance in discussing very vital issues. Sir. Uh, for your information, I've been actually listening to your views ever since I was a reporter. That was 1992. Okay, and uh, thank you for your views. Now, before we proceed, uh, let us first recognize the entities that have supported this event. You know? uh, San Miguel Corporation, Agriculture Policy, uh, Agriculture Credit and Policy Council, and uh, Planters Products Inc. And uh, Planter Product, Planters Products uh, is asking me to plug their magazine. Yeah, it's Greenfields Magazine. And uh, you can visit their website. And what I've heard is this magazine dates back to 1972, and this is one of the issues in 1999. So uh, it's a magazine that's actually part of the agriculture scene since 1970, so uh, you can visit their Facebook page. I kind of agree with what Dr. Villegas said, that we should move away from a rice-centric type of uh, economy. And from what I have really observed, the opportunity to achieve rice self-sufficiency was only up to 2007, and beyond that, because of the weather disturbances, I think it's already impossible to do. Anyway, let us go to our next speaker. Our next speaker is uh, Dr. Jose Camacho Jr. He is the 10th Chancellor of UPLB, and his mission for UPLB is to future-proof UPLB. And uh, it was in 2007 that Dr. Camacho obtained his Doctor of Economics from Kyoto University, with specialization in economics of education, labor, and human resource. And he holds a master's of arts in economics from Erasmus University International Institute of Social Studies in The Hague, Netherlands. And of course, he obtained his Bachelor of Science in Economics from UPLB. And I think he was challenged by Dr. Dart to make UPLB more relevant to agro-industrialization, and uh, yes, he says that he can do it. And in fact, his mission is to future-proof UPLB. So let us give the floor to Dr. Jose Camacho. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you, Conrad. And uh, to Secretary Dar of the Department of Agriculture, Dr. Villegas, uh, one of my lodis. Uh, naging presidente po kami ni Dr. Villegas ng Philippine Economic Society uh, to the uh, editorial management team of Manila Times led by its uh, president, uh, Mr. Dante Ang. And to all our viewers who are wat watching us at the Facebook and YouTube, good morning. Good morning. Thank you for watching us. And... Uh, it's my great pleasure to join all of you today uh, in this forum with the title Prospects of Agriculture uh, Beyond the COVID Pandemic. And this is indeed a very timely platform for discussion on the prospective state of one of our most vital sectors as we navigate toward a uh, possible ending of this pandemic. And the world is in its grip for over a year now. And if there's one thing that this pandemic should have impressed on us all, it is the importance of the agricultural uh, sector. It reminded us how much of a necessity uh, agricultural goods and services are, especially during times of uh, this uh, crisis. Indeed, uh, agriculture, as we all know, talagang Naging backbone siya ng Philippine economy. Kaya may pandemic man o walang pandemic. And you have seen how uh, Secretary Dar has shown us uh, the, the figures. No? Um, so even after this uh, pandemic, it is all the more we have to ensure that Philippine agriculture uh, does not have to fall on the wayside as uh, has happened so many times before. We must maintain the momentum uh, gained by initiating long-term policy reforms as uh, what uh, Secretary Dar and Dr. Villegas has mentioned. All the more drumming, drumming uh, up 
uh, budgetary and uh, resource support for this important sector. Most importantly, we must craft and implement agricultural programs that work, that are science and evidence-based, sustainable, inclusive, and I dare say, future proof. Dr. Dar and uh, Dr. Villegas mentioned how uh, we can uh, harness the higher education system, state universities and colleges in future proofing the agricultural sector. And as the national university focused on the agriculture, we at the UPLB is committed to the development of Philippine agriculture together with other agricultural uh, universities in the country in partnership with the Department of Agriculture and other national government agencies, local government units, and the uh, private sector. We wholeheartedly support the inclusive market-oriented development frameworks espoused by uh, Secretary Dar, which focuses the entirety of the, the agribusiness value chain, as mentioned uh, by uh, Dr. Villegas, toward fulfilling the shifting needs of both uh, local and global markets. I believe that uh, adopting this framework will ensure a robust agricultural sector in the long run that will thrive past the pandemic. But of course, this will require a degree of adaptability and flexibility, which needs to be worked on. Embracing digital technologies and applying them to key points in the agribusiness uh, value chain will be critical for uh, success. And I can uh, empathize with uh, Dr. Villegas when he saw this, uh, this uh, uh, rise being uh, uh, seen in the highways. No? Whenever I go back to, to Pangasinan, I can still see a lot of roads being you know, filled with this uh, rice. So, uh, so it's really uh, not really to be pessimistic, but uh, the agricultural sector, we have to be optimistic, especially in this time of uh, pandemic. And here at UPLB, we have initiated uh, projects and programs. For instance, we have the SARAI, the S-A-R-A-I or the smarter approaches to invigorate agriculture as an industry in the Philippines, is one such application using weather data, uh, satellite information, agronomic data, market data, farmer profiles, to develop decision support tools that will help answer questions, such as when to plant, where, what variety to plant, what's the smartest way to irrigate, to fertilize or to manage pests? What's the status of crop production or damages? And where to sell? Speaking on uh, the last point, the agricultural sector needs to take advantage of the uh, growing popularity of uh, the digital marketplaces, as we have seen uh, during this uh, pandemic. These online platforms were already on the rise prior to the pandemic, which has only highlighted how convenient they are. With better support mechanisms in place, online marketplaces can only uh, continue to, to grow, to, to, to thrive. And we must find a way to integrate them into the Philippine uh, agribusiness value chain in a way that allows all uh, stakeholders to, to benefit. And uh, one way to do so is to provide innovations that will make the logistics of transporting perishable agricultural goods easier and more viable. 
technology such as the individual quick phrase, the liquid quick phrase, and the active and smart packaging are but a few examples of such uh, innovations. We have seen this uh, uh, with the programs of the Department of Science and Technology in collaboration uh, with most uh, state universities and colleges. We can also consider the hybrid uh, fruit and vegetable varieties that are drought resistant, flood resistant, and high yielding, as well as new post harvest uh, processing methods for uh, various uh, food uh, items. And all of these are avenues of research that UPLB and other agricultural state universities and colleges, including where uh, Dr. Dar has uh, graduated from, Benguet State University. All of us, we have committedly pursued in the past up to the present. We are open to future collaborations with both uh, the Department of Agriculture, with the Commission on Higher Education, uh, Technical Panel on Agriculture, and with the various private enterprises with regards to this technology development. And we look forward to what we can achieve uh, working together. As is evident, collaboration and innovation are the two key values that we must focus on in moving forward. Innovation in logistics and agricultural products, innovation in agricultural risk mitigation through uh, better decision-making tools and financing, and even innovation in business models that address the small and the very uh, fragmentary nature of Filipino farm holdings all implemented through the unified efforts of the Department of Agriculture, the academe, and the uh, private sector. And there are two possible models of uh, innovations that we can suggest. First, as uh, again mentioned by uh, Dr. Uh, Villegas, uh, the agribusiness clusters, and second, uh, community-supported uh, agriculture. Agribusiness clusters are a group of competing, collaborating, and interdependent uh, businesses with a value chain where they promote uh, inclusive development and growth, where they create value networks and promote sustainability of uh, the benefits through effective and long-term uh, relationships. And on the other hand, uh, Community-supported agriculture involves a localized food production and consumption system organized to uh, share farming risk between producers and consumers, practice ecologically sensitive forms of uh, food production, and they contribute to building community and educating the shareholders about uh, agricultural processes and realities through their uh, participation. We need to harness this, uh, this uh, community-based uh, agricultural initiatives. So both of these business models are frameworks which we can implement easily through partnerships with local government units and which will strengthen the Philippine agricultural sector as a whole, ideally to the point that we can consider uh, increasing our exports. And increasingly, an increasingly uh, uh, globalized nature of market means that with a high enough uh, quality and uh, quantity uh, alongside with the prerequisite of international certifications, I believe that uh, Philippine agricultural products can easily carve out a niche in the international market. And, uh, well, unfortunately at present, we seem uh, unable to keep up with the demand. And many Filipino companies are reluctant to invest in international certifications due to uh, the very high cost involved. Once again, the answer here is collaboration, infrastructure and support from the national government, research on possible export niches from the academe, 
and active investments from the private sector on these areas and uh, products. Dr. Villegas mentioned uh, the bigger companies uh, owned by uh, the conglomerates. And through a goal-oriented collaboration, uh, we can build a Philippine agricultural sector that is global in scale, in scope, and reach. One that is enticing to uh, future generations of uh, farmers. And the latter point is important for us. We at the uh, sector of higher education institutions, uh, state universities and colleges, focusing on agricultural development. If we wish to ensure a future-proof agricultural sector, we must convince the youth to choose agriculture as a career. And we must make agriculture enticing, exciting, a thrilling prospect that is both financially rewarding and emotionally satisfying to pursue, not a burden. That is why we highlight agriculture as a degree program in our recruitment of the best and the brightest. This is my response to Dr. Villegas, whether providing short-term uh, training programs in agribusiness or formal degree programs, as he has mentioned, uh, that uh, was started by Harvard uh, University. In fact, the, the, the agribusiness program uh, uh, model of Harvard was uh, uh, patterned uh, uh, by, uh, was uh, actually a model for the Department of Agribusiness and Management here in UPLP. And indeed, we want to make sure that we do not run out of valuable human resources, focus on our country's most important sector, the agricultural sector. The previous Manila Times, I found out, your, your forum had uh, Cherry Atilano of Agria and Jairus Ferrer of iFarms as the, the guest speakers. They and other young entrepreneurs in the agricultural sectors like them, they must be given more exposure so that other young people can be inspired to follow uh, their example. Aside from our recruitment program, UPLB, in collaboration with other state universities on agriculture, we are doing our part in this endeavor by constantly improving and revamping our curriculum to make it more updated and suited to the youth from the course content, applications, and our teaching methodologies. We engage our students in promoting agriculture evidence-based related research technologies, and knowledge products that uh, the university uh, produces. Even when this pandemic is over, uh, we must not forget that beyond this pandemic lies the global challenge of ensuring food security and nutrition for an ever-growing uh, population, which uh, has shown by uh, Secretary Dar in terms of uh, its impact on poverty, unemployment, demand for food supplies will continue to increase even as production grows more difficult due to the worsening effects of uh, climate change. And uh, the fourth industrial revolution mentioned by Dr. Uh, uh, Villegas gives us solutions to this challenge in the form of bioengineered crops, digital farm management tools, and other development uh, of uh, new technologies uh, mentioned by Secretary Dar, precision agriculture, smart agriculture. Thus, agriculture and food production will continue to remain uh, relevant. But at the same time, we must ensure that it will continue to be a priority, especially in terms of policy and budgetary uh, support. To end, Allow me to reiterate that through focus and collaborative effort, including this uh, initiative by Manila Times, we shall work hard to create a sustainable, inclusive, and 
I dare say again, a future-proof Philippine agricultural sector. Maray pong salamat. Okay, at this point, uh, we have we've had many questions uh, for for all our speakers, uh, in particular uh, Dr. Dar, uh, but um, Dr. Viegas and Dr. Camacho, and feel free to jump in as well. Uh, some from some from our group here, and then a number of them from online. Uh, I have a couple of questions. Um, a couple of these are mine, and a couple of them come from. Uh, uh, come from other places, but uh, one one thing that one thing that I wanted to ask. Um, this is a question that came to mind while you were talking about food prices, and I think it I think it would be very uh, pertinent to to the public. Uh, I don't know how much how, how much comfort they can take in this, but uh, to what degree do does the increase the recent increase in food prices here? Um, how different is that than the overall global? trends um, because I had the impression that it was actually not that far from what was happening everywhere else even though the causes for it may be unique is that a reasonable uh, reasonable perspective uh, what can you tell us about that yeah I I have seen uh, related questions uh, in the chat box so I will try to bring these questions together. <laughs> First, let me project a slide here about the ASF positive incidents. Because if you compare to last year from July to December, you know, there was a peak of ASF positive incidents in August last year, September, but started to decline in October, November now. And as of March, there are just 62 incidences in uh, ASF today. Uh, well, this is uh, why, why is this happening? It is a combination of uh, airports. Uh, the uh, quarantine protocols are being uh, elevated more engagement of the uh, local uh, government units, more uh, awareness now of the uh, uh, hug, hug raisers uh, assisting. So it's a confluence of factors now. But having said that, uh, what the population has been decimated at the level of 3 million uh, hugs from a 12.7 million hug inventory. The inventory today is only about 9.7 million metric tons. So about 24% have been decimated. And that's why uh, there is uh, the need to, uh, you know, when, when we talk of ensuring food security in this particular case now, you, you need, uh, uh, I will bring you to my next slide which is now the measures to revive hog industry and reduce pork prices. The first uh, option is to enhance local production, which is a first priority. But the challenge here still is the presence of ASF. So uh, we, we have to look at, uh, there are now efforts to repopulate uh, starting in the green zones, uh, we have Land Bank of the Philippines, no, uh, ACPC, uh, con uh, having 500 million pesos to start in the green, green zones. Now, the 600 million here will be started uh, as sentineling project for, uh, we, we have shifted gears uh, the last two days, repopulation by way of uh, introducing what we call the sentineling project uh, we will need to uh, use up uh, about 400 million pesos and 200 million pesos is for uh, breeders, restocking for breeders, uh, hog breeders. And uh, the uh, fight against CSF, we have a budget of 1.5 billion. We now have, uh, we are in the process of procuring 
a rapid PCR so that uh, we can deploy this. These are new uh, developments. Deploy this in the provinces so that it, there will be a quick response in terms of, uh, you know, uh, having to respond to the uh, presence or uh, of ASF. And we, we, we are elevating as we continue always to the, enhance that partnership with LGUs. We have also for commercial hog racers, we have secured 27 billion pesos from Land Bank and DBP uh, so that uh, with uh, this, uh, the hog racers uh, will be uh, able to now come forward and repopulate. Now, what's the, what's the incentive? We now go to hug insurance. There is a subsidy level uh, per hug for partners, for example. The subsidy, no, the, yeah, this ob overall we will be for commercial hug raisers giving 22% of the uh, premium. So 78% uh, will be shouldered by the uh, commercial hog racers. But for the backyard hog racers, they will now be automatically be part of the insurance system but, and they will be also uh, indemnified 100%. So that, that's uh, from the 5,000 partners will now be doubled into 10,000, 100%. So this is the set of incentives and measures to enhance repopulation while fighting ASF. Now, uh, how are we tackling the food prices? There is the executive order 124 that is in place. And we, we, can, we have been able to mobilize supplies from surplus provinces. Today, we have reached uh, for the last how many weeks now? 212,000 hogs plus uh, a good million kilos of carcasses. And uh, this will end April 8th. And uh, SRPs will be there. Uh, and uh, of course, we are strengthening economic intelligence as well. So improving the whole supply chain because there are wholesalers, uh, traders that are really managing this uh, this problem of having higher pork prices. Uh, pork diversification is one strategy so that there are other sources of protein. And of course, uh, the last resort is supply augmentation. And uh, there are two uh, measures here, increasing the MAP volume from 54,000 to a total of 400,000 and lowering of tariff. So these twin measures will encourage uh, the this tariff rate for pork needs to be low enough for imports to be competitive. And uh, if not, importation of pork will not be enough to temper prices. So ito po, uh, as I've said earlier, even at the global level, there is increasing prices of pork. There is even increasing prices of uh, uh, feeds and uh, or feed sources. So we, we really have to do a balancing act uh, for, for us to really uh, be able uh, not only to bring uh, and accelerate the reshaping, the repopulation of the hog industry while uh, maintaining uh, affordable prices in the market. I hope I have answered the question. Okay. Um, yeah, that's uh, that's very helpful. Thank you. A um, couple other a couple other questions here, but I have a question for both you and Dr. Viegas. If I could if I could jump in with one uh, one of my own here, uh, the BSP uh, very quickly just uh, made a number of changes to the um, to to the uh, uh, the agri agri law rules uh, for banks, uh, basically expanding, um, you know, the the uh, the kind of things that qualify as uh, meeting the percentage. And I was just curious uh, whether you think that will hurt or help um, get some of these funds actually to to, you know, the agricultural sector, because that is 
I, you know, after all, that is the point of the whole thing. I, I realize it was it was also done with uh, banking stability in mind, but um, are they, did they maybe do that at the expense of the agriculture sector? Because uh, a lot of the things that you've described uh, today, I, you need money for them, and and we have been fighting the problem of banks not lending enough to the sector for years actually and it's become you know it's, it's become an even even more critical problem right now so uh what do you what do you think of that and then uh, related to uh related to funding um or dealing with uh dealing with money um in general uh we have a question from our reporter about the coconut levy and when uh, you might think you would be start to see uh, some of that roll out and um, what the timeline for the initial programs that are planned are. Uh, let, let me start uh, from a broader perspective. Do we have enough budgetary support for the sector of agriculture? We don't have. Uh, that's not only this time around, but uh, previously, it's underfunded. Uh, we need more resources to really unlock and unleash the potential of the sector. The parity principle that I've said, uh, annual budget, we are only take, uh, getting 2.5%. Uh, supposedly, uh, if you have a 4.5 trillion budget, we should be getting 9% of that. Uh, but we, we are only getting a very uh, small amount. Uh, 2.5%. Now, going back to the coconut industry. Now, be, before that, that's why I highlighted rice, the, the new record rice uh, production, because it's heavily funded. So this is a showcase that if you have significant investment, then you have a higher rate of return. In this case, a uh, higher level of productivity and you are able to bring up to the 90% level of food sufficiency, I mean rice sufficiency level. And of course, uh, I understand what uh, Dr. Bernie Villegas have said, uh, we should not be uh, at all costs uh, going to 100% uh, because of the enormity and the uh, level of budget needed, which we don't have. We need more irrigation systems to be developed. We need more farm-to-market roads. We need more farm uh, post-harvest facilities and the like. Now, back to coconut. The first board meeting of the newly constituted PCA board met last uh, uh, March 15. So the motion is in place. The, the, the journey for this coconut levy trust fund is now in place. We are accelerating another meeting we have created the executive committee uh, to meet again Monday to look at the timelines uh, that are needed to uh, be put in place, like the uh, election of uh, farmers' representatives, one each from the zone Visayas and Mindanao. And so they will have to recommend at least three to four per region. And... Uh, the president will select from this listing. So it's about uh, a 90-day process. And hoping that once we complete the board in 90 days, so from March 15, uh, hoping that the, uh, the first uh, budgetary uh, recommendations uh, from the board based on the law uh, we'll now uh, we will we'll see uh, starting third quarter the start of the flow of funds to support the various components as articulated in the new law on coconut levy. Okay, um, okay, that's that's good to hear. So, so within the year we should start seeing some real action on that. Is just basically basically what you're saying um and there was a now i'm i'm told we have just a few minutes left um and uh, of course we have plenty of questions that we could go at this all day but um the, uh, the, there's a question here for dr viegas um 
And, or, uh, no, I'm sorry. Um, Dr. Camacho, uh, has there has there been an increase in the number of agriculture related courses lately? Um, and uh, I, I've had I had a question, too, with the with the restrictions um, uh, caused by the pandemic. Has uh, have you been able to keep up the amount of research that you ordinarily do at UPLB? Uh, in terms of uh, the courses, uh, yes, we have uh, we have uh, reengineered uh, the BS Agriculture uh, program, uh, allowing more innovations in terms of uh, uh, courses. Uh, for instance, focus on uh, those that will focus on uh, smart agriculture. Uh, in in the BS agriculture program, if 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 uh, the related question is about uh, in terms of enrollment, uh, yes, there is a a uh, marked increase in enrollment, except when the the K to twelve uh, was implemented in 20, 2012, 2013. But uh, with the efforts that we'll be uh, doing in, in really re-engineering the BS Agricultural Program, uh, we hope to attract more students uh, into the program. With regards to the restrictions uh, as it affects uh, our efforts on uh, uh, agricultural research and development, uh, we have... Uh, research, uh, especially those that uh, will require uh, field work uh, that uh, in, in this a big challenge to, for, for, for our researchers to go to the field. And uh, yeah, I would say, yes, there is a impact uh, in terms of uh, making uh, significant progress in, in finishing their research. Okay. So was, uh, I, this question is for uh, Dr. Villegas. Uh, can you say how many years are we behind in terms of uh, agro-industrialization compared to, say, Vietnam? Uh, because I know very well that 20 or 30 years ago, we were way ahead of Vietnam. But now, uh, we've fallen behind. And uh, could you cite what caused this? Was it faulty policies or pure negligence on the part of the government? I think we're at least five years behind Vietnam now in agricultural productivity, obviously in rice, but even in such new crops as coffee, fisheries. And I think it has been generally to the neglect of infrastructures. The Vietnamese government has been very, very focused on infrastructures in the countryside. Let me give you an anecdote. I accompanied once a group of businessmen to Ho Chi Minh, and they were condescending when they saw Ho Chi Minh, oh, very undeveloped uh, city. They don't have a Fort Bonifacio, they don't have a Makati, etc. Really, Ho Chi Minh is not a very impressive uh, urban city. But the moment we started going to Da Nang and the other places, wow, it's amazing how the Vietnamese government has preferred the countryside to the urban areas. That's the explanation. They were given all the necessary support to be productive in the small farming communities. And that is what we're still struggling to do. I said there is some optimism because right now the budget is really more focused on the countryside. But we have many more years, especially compared to Thailand, which 20 years ago started rural development in earnest. No? Okay, so I think uh, we've uh, really, for today, we really had a very, very, very centered and uh, uh, intelligent discussion. And uh, we've run out of time to ask more questions, but we're very, very happy that we had a very, very, uh, you know, at, uh, substantial discussion with our panelists for today, especially, uh, you know, at, uh, this, uh, discussing the agriculture sector's future post-COVID is very important because you know, uh, the bottom line is that people should not, never go hungry and there is still a lot of uh, potential for the agriculture sector. So uh, any any uh, uh, closing words, uh, Dr. Ben? Hi, Sir Ben. 
Uh, no, I would just like to, to thank the thank the three of you for joining us today. Uh, every time um, any of us and whatever we do try to do uh, these kind of forward looking things under the conditions we, we are working in now, which we hope will end someday soon. I think we're seeing the end of it. Um, you know, it's very appreciated. And uh, it's also very appreciated that uh, you give us something progressive to look forward to. Um, and it's nice to nice to see that uh, there is some long term thinking and development going on. Um, I would just like to thank everybody. It's uh, good to see you again, Dr. Dar, and uh, nice to have a chance to speak to both of you gentlemen, um, Conrad, uh, I guess we've, I guess we've all been having fun with, uh, digital infrastructure today. Um, it's, it's kind of caught us all. So it's, uh, I'm glad we, glad we pulled this off. Um, thank you everybody. And, uh, thank you, Conrad. And, uh, why don't you finish us off? Yes. Uh, of course we'd like to thank uh, the three gentlemen, uh, Agriculture Secretary William Dar, uh, Dr. Jose Camacho, the, cha the Chancellor of uh, UPLB, and I would say renowned uh, uh, economist and prophet of boom, Dr. Bernardo Villegas. Uh, yes. So, uh, of course, I'd like, we'd like to thank our sponsors, uh, San Miguel Corporation, Planters Products Incorporated, and Agriculture Credit and policy council. Uh, without them, uh, this this event wouldn't have pushed through. And uh, nakikiusap na yung PPI, yeah. Get a hold of their latest magazine of uh, Greenfields. Uh, you just can visit their website. Um, unfortunately, they uh, they couldn't get their AVP on board. But uh, yun nga, no, uh, we'd like to thank these three uh, gentlemen. And uh, let's hope now we can get another one of these. Uh, Maybe then by the, before the end of this year, and by that time, let us pray that the pandemic would be under control and that the, you know what we won't be hearing much bad news from media. And uh, sana by that time, we would be discussing uh, the issues alongside a lot of good news from the economy. And of course, uh, sana nga matapos na itong pandemic na to. So thank you very much and uh, see you next time. Maraming salamat po.